this discussion is a continuation of the discussion about apsidal precession the link to that video is in the description in nodal precession the orbital plane of an elliptic orbit itself precesses around the rotational axis basically this inclined plane which encompasses this elliptic uh, satellite orbit around the earth in red line uh, the plane encompassing this red line itself rotates about the north-south axis of the Earth. Probably we can best visualize it in full 3D in our VR headset. The apsidal precession happens in the plane of revolution itself. But in nodal precession, the plane of revolution itself is getting displaced. If there was no precession, then the object starting from point A1 will get back to the same point A1 after one revolution. But with nodal precession, the object may end up to the left or to the right of the point A1. Basically, nod nodal precession is an interplay between the longitudinal and the latitudinal angles. This figure shows the case in which the object is revolving in an anti-clockwise manner but the nodal precession is in the reverse direction that is in the clockwise fashion so this is a retrograde precession and we get this when the coefficient of theta is greater than one in this formula that is tan phi equals tan phi max into sine of tau into theta when tau is one there will be no nodal precession when tau is greater than 1, we get retrograde precession as shown here. Eventually, the orientation of the plane of revolution flips from this configuration to this configuration over half the nodal precession time period. The bluish gray region is the plane of Earth's revolution around the sun. The orangish tinge uh, region is the plane of moon's revolution around the Earth. The plane of moon's revolution has an inclination with respect to the plane of Earth's revolution. The points where the moon's orbit inter intersects the plane of Earth's revolution are called the nodes. This is the ascending node where the moon is moving up and this is the descending node where the moon is going down. The line connecting the two nodes is called the line of nodes. This is not just applicable for moon, but for any artificial satellite or any two-body system in general. During a nodal precession, the line of nodes is rotating in this bluish-gray plane. The moon keeps orbiting in its uh, this orangish plane, but the orange plane itself is rotating and and the ascending and the descending nodes go around in a circular path in this gray plane. If there is no nodal precession, then these nodes and the line of nodes remain stationary. And also the plane of revolution remains stationary. From a non-rotating Earth, we would see the same elliptical orbit repeat over and over again. And this is how it would look on the 2D Mercator projection map. Just note, these observations are from an inertial frame, assuming as if the Earth is not rotating, so that we don't get into the Coriolis force and other pseudo forces issue. The whole discussion is from the point of view of an inertial reference frame. In order to tackle this problem of precession of nodes, we need to consider the 3D spherical polar coordinate system as shown here. Small r is the distance between the two bodies, like the distance between Earth and Moon or Earth and Sun. The larger mass is assumed to be stationary at the center of mass or the center of revolution. Theta is the longitudinal angle, phi is the latitude angle. The position vector of the smaller mass with respect to the larger mass is vector capital R is equal to small r outside the square brackets into cos phi into cos theta i plus sine theta j in the brackets plus sine phi k. 
In this process, the K component angular momentum is conserved. A subscript K is the K component of angular momentum. It is defined as equal to m r square cos square phi d theta by dt. This m r square cos square phi d theta by dt is a constant determined by the initial conditions. The net energy E is also conserved. The energy E is equal to half m dr by dt square. This is the radial kinetic energy plus half a k square this a k is the constant k component angular momentum. So this half a k square divided by m r square cos square phi is the zonal kinetic energy. Then g m m by r naught is a constant and it's not important to describe here. This minus g m m by r term is the familiar gravitational potential energy. And there is an additional uh, energy term, half b by m r square cos square phi. The energy equation has an additional energy term, half b by m r square cos square phi. In case of pure elliptic orbits without nodal precession, this term b will be zero. Here it is some non-zero constant. Note this term half b by m r square cos square phi is similar to the zonal energy term half a k square by m r square cos square phi. This new term half b by m r square cos square phi basically comes from the gravitational field. The gravitational potential is modified due to some reason, for example, presence of a third mass, asymmetries in the mass distribution of the massive object, etc. So the gravitational potential is no longer simply minus gmm by r, but is modified by this inverse square term. The new gravitational potential energy term is minus gmm by r plus half b by m r square cos square phi. There is a new angular momentum like variable called a n, which gets conserved. The subscript n here stands for new. a n squared is defined as uh, a n squared equals a k square divided by cos square phi. This term is related with the zonal component plus b divided by cos square phi. This term comes from the altered gravitational potential plus m square r power 4 d phi by dt square. This term is related to the meridional component. The summation of the, these three terms is a constant and it has units of angular momentum squared. The actual magnitude of the angular momentum squared, that is a square, is equal to the summation of only these two terms. One from the zonal component and one from the meridional component. It does not have this B term coming from the gravitational potential. So the new angular momentum like variable a n is related with the actual magnitude of the angular momentum a as this. a n square is equal to a square plus b by cos square phi. This whole thing, the summation is a constant. Note the actual magnitude uh, square, that is a square is not a constant here. However, when b equals zero, we get a n square is equal to a square is a constant. So basically which means that the B term coming from the gravitational potential is providing some torque so that A square becomes a variable. That is the angular momentum is varying. In the absence of the B term, A square remains constant. So putting it all together, we have three conservation laws governing this process. The K component of the angular momentum is conserved. The net energy is conserved. And a new angular momentum like variable A n is conserved. Unlike the K component term A k and the new angular momentum term A n, these two equations uh, uh, we can 
using these two equations we can arrive at a relationship between the lat ln variables or the phi theta variables as this tan phi here phi is the latitude variable showing the north south position of the object tan phi is equal to square root of a n square minus a square plus b divided by a square plus b this is a constant coefficient for the sine function uh the sine function is the sine of theta not plus or minus square root of 1 plus b by ak square into theta the coefficient of theta inside the sine function is what causes the nodal precession and theta not is a constant of integration related with initial condition the system of these three conservation equations is equivalent to this one force balance equation in vector form that is d square by dt square of capital vector r that is the acceleration of the smaller mass is determined by two force factors one is the familiar gravitational force gmm by r square directed along r cap or the radial direction along vector r and the additional b by m square r cube cos cube phi force factor coming from the modified gravitational field and directed along the zonal direction cos theta i plus sin theta j it kind of makes sense that the nodal precession is associated with this additional force in zonal direction this b force factor produces pure and uniform nodal precession without any added complexities in the motion that is why it is called ideal nodal precession in the real world example for example the j2 perturbation case of earth uh, the j2 pro perturbation produces other additional motion components than just pure nodal precession if we want pure and ideal form of nodal precession then we need this b factor in our equations let's consider only the positive solution and consider theta not to be zero then we get this expression which can be expressed in a much simpler form as tan phi equals tan phi max into sin of tau theta we can note there is a difference in uh, phi max estimation that is the estimation of the northernmost and the southernmost positions in the trajectory basically phi max gives the northernmost or the southernmost uh, positions in the trajectory so that value will change whether uh, b is zero or b not zero when uh, in the two cases the value changes value of phi max changes however this variation is not important for the topic of nodal precession so we skip that we focus on the tau factor which is the coefficient of the longitudinal angle theta tau is equal to square root of 1 plus b divided by ak square so the nodal precession rate depends on the k component of the angular momentum determined by initial conditions and the b factor coming from modified gravitational potential at theta equal 0 phi is also zero phi zero means the mass is located on the equator when tau theta becomes pi by 2 the trajectory hits its northernmost location phi max note here it is not theta that is pi by 2 but it is tau theta then when tau theta becomes pi the trajectory is back to equator phi is zero when tau theta becomes 3 pi by 2 the trajectory hits its southernmost location that is phi is minus phi max now finally when tau theta becomes 2 pi the latitudinal angle is back to equator after completing one cycle that is phi is zero again after completing one whole cycle but the angle theta or the longitudinal angle has either not yet completed the cycle or has completed a bit more than a cycle depending on the value of b that is phi has completed one uh, complete cycle but theta has not 
Phi has had started from the equator, gone north, and then gone south and come back to the equator. This is one phi cycle. At the same time, the theta, if the uh, trajectory there was no nodal position, then uh, then theta should have also completed one cycle and it should have completed a two pi rotation. At the end of one phi cycle or the cycle of the latitudinal angle, the value of theta is given by this expression. Theta equals 2 pi divided by square root of 1 plus b by a k square. So if b value is greater than 0, the theta value will be less than 2 pi at the end of one phi cycle. So theta has not yet completed the cycle in this case, which means the orbit has precessed in the reverse direction of the basic revolution. So this is a retrograde nodal precession. If B value is less than zero, then the theta value will be greater than two pi at the end of one phi cycle. So theta has completed more than one cycle at this time, which means the orbit has precessed in the same direction as the basic revolution. So this is a prograde nodal precession. On a simple 2D plot of phi versus theta graphs, this is how the precession looks. The black line is the uh, no nodal precession case as tau equals zero. Uh, tau equals one, b equals zero, tau equals one. The theta and phi angles complete the cycles in synchrony. The phi starts at zero and com comes back to zero when uh, theta completes exactly two pi radians or 360 degree rotation. So both are in uh, synchrony and they complete the cycles together. Red line is the retrograde nodal precision case. Here tau equals 1.1. We can see that the red line reaches phi max earlier than the black line. The theta and phi angles are not in synchrony. Phi starts at zero and comes back to zero when theta is still uh, less than two pi. The theta has not covered the whole cycle. Theta is less than two pi at this uh, stage or less than 360 degree as seen in the figure. See, this black line has completed 360 degree after one cycle, uh, theta, theta in this black line. But this red line is to the left of it. It is less than two pi. Theta is less than two pi. Green line is the prograde nodal precession case. Tau equals 0.9 here. We can see that the green line reaches phi max later than the black line. The theta and phi angles are again not in synchrony in this case. Phi starts at zero and comes back to zero when theta has completed more than two pi radians or more than 360 degrees. It has completed more than a cycle, more, a bit more than a cycle. So this is how the tau coefficient occurring with theta creates nodal precession. So to recap, we get nodal precession when the gravitational potential energy is modified by this inverse square term, both in the energy, we see it in the energy equations and also in the force equation. Or uh, equivalently, the force equation is modified by this uh, inverse cube term point pointed along the zonal direction. So under this modified gravity condition, we get precessing orbits, which are almost same as elliptical orbits in form, but with a theta coefficient, which causes the precession. In the next parts, we shall discuss the apsidal and nodal precession occurring together in the same equation. We had discussed uh, it as separate components, nodal precession separate and apsidal, but in the next, we'll put them together and also try applying it to explain the precision of Earth or Moon or satellites, uh, etc. So that's about it for now. Please like and share the video and subscribe to Neophysics YouTube channel. Thank you.